Mr. President, thank you for allowing us to come here. We asked for this interview because your country's been at war for four years. Uh, it is a humanitarian um, crisis, uh, perhaps the worst on the planet right now. Uh, 200,000 Syrians have died, uh, 4 million refugees, uh, 10 million have left their homes, life expectancy is down, 50% of your country is occupied by hostile forces, it's become a battleground for outside forces. What's next? Because we have seen since I last visited you the rise of ISIS. We have seen uh, Hezbollah in here. We have seen um, the United States become increasingly concerned about ISIS, so much so that the President uh, and especially the Secretary of State have said there is a need for a negotiated settlement. Actually, the beginning of uh, your question uh, is exaggerated, exaggerating the numbers a uh, little bit, but that's not the issue. I'll always invite the media and the West and the officials to deal with those numbers, not as spreadsheet and numbers and counter. Actually, it's bereaved families who uh, uh, lost uh, their dear ones. It's a tragedy that's been going through every, every Syrian family lost someone, lost their livelihood, and so on. Uh, whether it's few thousand or hundreds of thousands, it's a tragedy. Uh, what's next? Actually, every uh, conflict should end up with uh, dialogue, with political solution between the different parties. And that's what we have been doing in Syria during the last two years, dealing directly with the militants, and we su succeeded in do making some reconciliations. Uh, regarding the rise of ISIS, in the context of events in Syria during the last four years, ISIS didn't rise suddenly. It's, not, it's impossible for such bigger than what we call organization and smaller than state to appear suddenly with all these resources, financial resources, human resources, without support from the outside and without being, being prepared gradually or incrementally for a long time before the sudden rise during last uh, summer. So the rise of ISIS is not a precise word because it didn't happen suddenly. It was a result of event that uh, happened at the beginning of the uh, conflict that we mentioned in our statements many times, but no one in the West has listened to. Uh, if I want to uh, mention uh, the statement of uh, Kerry regarding the dialogue. Uh, I would say what we have in Syria so far is only a statement. Uh, nothing concrete yet, uh, no facts, no new reality regarding the political approach of the United States toward our situation, our problem, our conflict uh, in Syria. But uh, as principle, in Syria we, we could say that every dialogue is a positive thing. And we're going to be open to any dialogue with anyone, including the United States, regarding anything based on mutual respect Tell and without, without breaching the sovereignty of Syria. And as principle, I would say that this approach, new approach of the United States toward not only Syria, toward anyone to make dialogue regarding any issue is a positive thing, but we have to wait for the reality. What kind of communication is there between your government and the American government? There's no direct communication. None at all? No, no, not, no, no direct. No uh, conversations about what kind of settlement nothing. might take place, no conversations about how to fight ISIS? Nothing yet. That's why the United States... Nothing should, yet? Nothing yet. Till this moment, no. Nothing. Would you like to have that happen? Uh, any dialogue is positive, as I said, in principle, of course, without preaching the sovereignty of Syria, especially regarding the fighting of terrorism. The way we defeat terrorism, that's a very important issue for us at this moment. But the question is, what are you prepared to do? It is your country that is suffering. What are you prepared to do in terms of negotiations? If part of that is to see a transition government of which you would give up power, would you be willing to do that? Anything regarding the Syrian internal politics should be related to the Syrian people, not to anyone. We're not going to discuss with the Americans or with anyone what are we going to do regarding our political system, our constitution, uh, or uh, our laws, or our procedures. We can cooperate with them regarding fighting the terrorism and making pressure on different countries like Turkey and Saudi Arabia and Qatar and some of their allies in Europe that supports the terrorist 
politically, and financially, and by military means. This cannot end militarily. Do you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. Every conflict, even if it's a war, should end with a political solution. But then draw me a roadmap that you have for a political solution. Yeah. What does it look like? You have different levels. You have the internal levels, you have the regional, you have the international. And you have different means at the same time. The most important part is the local. The local part should, should have two things. A dialogue between the Syrians about everything, the political systems and any other details that could be beyond this, uh, about the future of the country, of course. Uh, second, make di direct dialogue with the militants, as we did during the last two years, in order to give them amnesty, and they give up their armaments and go back to their normal lives. When you say militants, who do you mean? Some of them are terrorists, some of them are uh, people who were implicated by the events for different reasons. So whoever carry a gun and try to destroy the public uh, uh, infrastructure or uh, attack people or cause any harm or breach the law in Syria, that's the militant. But it, it, so much of the power is in your hands uh, to engage in the process. I mean, if they demand that you step down before they negotiate, mm. that's unacceptable to you. Uh, by the militants, you mean? No, I mean by the United States and Russia and no, parties no. to the conversation. No, inter no external party has anything to do with the future of Syria, with the constitution or president or anything like this. No, we're not going to discuss it with them. This is the Syrian issue. Whenever the Syrian people want to change their president, it should be changed right away. In the same day, even if we exaggerate. Of course, it must be through a political process, through constitutional process. That's how we change presidents not through terrorism and inter external intervention. Some say that ISIS was the best thing that happened to you and that even some of the things that you have done have benefited ISIS. Uh, that because of the, what ISIS has done and because of your fight against the moderates in your country who in terms of the Arab Spring wanted to see more democracy here, uh, that you in the effort to crush them, allowed ISIS to grow. Yeah. Uh, let's go back to what President Obama said in one of his uh, interviews uh, recently, when he said that the moderate opposition in Syria is elusive. That's very clear by President Obama, and we always said there's no moderate opposition. So the rise of ISIS wasn't sudden again. The evisceration, the uh, uh, amputation, uh, eating the hearts of the victims started from the very beginning, and even beheading started from the very beginning of the conflicts. It started what they called the moderate opposition, then it, it continued with al-Nusra, then with ISIS. So what happened with those three, including ISIS, they attack military bases, they kill our soldier, and they destroy our economy. How could, according to this logic, how could that be the best thing happened to me? In what logic? To lose? to destroy the country, to kill your supporters, and to kill others, and to kill civilians. In what sense could that be the best thing that happened to me or to the government? That's illogical, that's unrealistic, that's unpalatable. When you, again, I come back to the, to the idea of, of how now, with the new reality of ISIS, how it's changed the circumstances. As they have gained in strength, uh, what new changes do you see in attitude towards you and staying <coughs> and the Syrian government. Regarding the West, you mean? Yes. Uh, I think the West has changed its calculations after the rise of ISIS, but that doesn't mean they changed their approach to the conflicts in Syria, in Iraq, and in our region. I don't think they've learned the lesson uh, well, and I, that, as a result, will not change the course of the event, because the very beginning of the problem from the Western perspective is to change the system or the president or the government that they don't like. And they are still moving in the same direction. That's why nothing concrete has changed yet, only the appearance and the priority. Their priority is to fight ISIS, but that doesn't mean their priority to get rid of ISIS. How can you see the United States cooperate with Syria regarding ISIS? There's no direct cooperation. 
but how do you see the future? Uh, the future, I mean. Uh, in the future, there must be a direct dialogue in order to fight terrorism because the terrorism, terrorism is in, on our ground, in our, on our soil. They cannot defeat it without our cooperation, without having our information because we lived with this uh, and we know the reality and how to defeat it. Most people believe there's cooperation unofficially and it goes through Iraq that somehow Syria knows when airstrikes are taking place by the United States because they get that information from Iraq. Yeah. From another third party, not only Iraq, more than one country told us that they're going to start uh, this campaign. How does that work? What do you mean? The in, you get information. You mean the campaign? Yes. How does it work on the ground regarding ISIS? Yes. Uh, as How I do say, you get information? About, uh, about American airstrikes and, oh. and so that it can coordinate with what you were doing As I said, it's so they're not bombing yeah. Syrian troops. Th through third party. And it was very clear that they're going, their aim is to attack ISIS, not the Syrian army. And that's what happened so far. The third party means Iraq and who else? Iraq, uh, another country, uh, Russian officials. Russian officials, Russian Iraqi officials. officials. Iraqi officials communicate to you yeah, yeah. the American intention. Exactly, in the, in the detail that I just mentioned now. The now what's the level of that information? Is it just about airstrikes? Yes. Is it about, just uh, about other activities on the ground that are taking place? No, no details, only the headlines and the principle that they're going to attack uh, uh, ISIS uh, in Syria and Iraq during the next few days. That's what we heard, nothing else. When, you're, when you shot down an American drone, did you know it was an American drone? No, because uh, any drone, any airplane, any aircraft will not tell you that I'm American. So whenever you have a foreign aircraft, you only shot, uh, shoot it. Hmm. This is the rules, uh, the military rules. How much of a benefit are you getting from American airstrikes in Syria, reducing the power of ISIS? Sometimes you could have local benefit but in general if you want to talk of, uh, in terms of ISIS actually ISIS has expanded since the beginning of the strikes not like some uh, American uh, wants to sugarcoat the situation as uh, to say that it's getting uh, better uh, ISIS has been defeated and so on actually no you have more recruits uh, some estimates that they have 1,000 recruits every month in Syria and Iraq they are expanding in, uh, in Libya and uh, many other uh, Al-Qaeda affiliates organization have announced their allegiance to ISIS. So that's the situation. How much, could, how much territory do they control in Syria? Sorry? How? ISIS controls how, how much okay. territory? Uh, 50%? Yeah, it's not regular war. You cannot, uh, you don't have criteria. It's, mm -hmm. it's not an army that make, made incursions. They go to, they try to infiltrate any area when they, there's no army. Uh, and when you have uh, inhabitants, uh, the question how much incubator they have, that's the question how much hearts and minds they want so far. This and how is, much of that? How do you measure that? Uh, you cannot measure it, but you can tell that the majority of the people who suffered from ISIS, they are supporting the government. Uh, and of course, uh, the rest of the Syrian people are afraid from ISIS. And uh, I don't think they win. I think they lost a lot of hearts and of, of minds. They've lost a lot. They've lost. Uh, except the very ideological people who have Wahhabi state of mind and ideology. Explain to me why people are fleeing to go to refugee camps in Jordan and Turkey. What are they fleeing from? Uh, actually, those the Syrian camps, army? No, the, the, those camps started being built before having any real conflicts in Syria. So it was premeditated at but the it's th over to three million people to be used as a humanitarian headline, entitled, and to be used against Syria to be uh, a pretext for uh, a military intervention. That's how it started. Then later they started uh, giving incentive to people to 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 flee there. Now the majority of those they uh, they fled because of the terrorism. And I'll give you an example. During the elections, the presidential elections, most of the refugees in Lebanon, for example, and even in Jordan, they voted for the president, not again the president. That's a concrete indication. You cannot ignore it. So they don't fled from the Syrian army. If they fled from the Syrian army, oh. because of the Syrian army, they would be in the other... Uh, I have interviewed some of them in the Jordanian refugee camps, and they were fearful of the Syrian army. 
and they were fearful of repercussions in Syria if people knew they were being interviewed. So they were reluctant to give their name and where they were from. But they had fled in fear of the Syrian army. That could happen. Of course, you have different kind of people. You have different perceptions. You have that perception. Now, we, we don't say that everybody fled just because of the terrorists. Uh, some people, they fled just because of the situation, not from the Syrian army nor from the terrorists. They, do, they want to go to a safer place. So, so they have different reasons for, for the refugees. There's another number that, that is alarming to me. It is that 90% of the civilian casualties, 90% come from the Syrian army. How did you get that result? That was a report that was issued uh, in the last six months. Okay, as I said earlier, the war is not about, it's not traditional war. It's not about capturing land and gaining land. It's about winning the hearts and minds of the Syrian. We cannot win the heart of minds of the Syrians while we are killing Syrians. We cannot sustain four years in that position as a government and me as president while the rest of the world, most of the world, the great powers and regional power are against me and my people are against me. That's impossible. I mean, this logic has no leg to stand on. So this is not realistic and this is against our interest as government is to kill the people. What do we get? What the benefit of killing the people? Well, I mean, the argument is that you, you, <coughs> there are weapons of war that have been used that most people look down on with great one is chlorine gas. They believe it has been used here. Uh, they said there is evidence of that and they would like to have the right to inspect to see where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. As you know, barrel bombs have been used mm -hmm. and they come from helicopters. And the only people who have helicopters is the Syrian army. And so those two acts of war, yeah. which the society looks down on mm -hmm. as let me fully answer this. It's very, acts. it's very important. This is part of the malicious propaganda against Syria. First of all, the chlorine gas is not military, military gas. You can buy it anywhere. Mm -hmm. and it's, but it can be weaponized. No, because it's not very effective. It's not used as military gas. That's very self-evident. Traditional armament is more important than chlorine. And if it was very effective, the, uh, the terrorists would have used this on a larger scale. Because it's not effective, it's not used very then much. Then why not let somebody come in and inspect it, see whether it's been used or not? We, 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 you, we, we you'd want be to. happy for that. Of course. We, we always ask a delegation, uh, impartial delegation, to come and investigate. But, I mean, logically and realistically, it cannot be, be used as a military. This is part of the propaganda because, as you know, in the media, when it bleeds, it leads. And they always look for something that bleeds, which is the chlorine gas and the bar barrel bomb. This is very important, the barrel bomb. What, what, what are barrel bombs? They said barrel bombs as a bomb that killed people indiscriminately. This is not uh, because it doesn't aim. This is not realistic for one reason, because no army uses bomb that doesn't aim. But and the proof to what I'm saying that you don't talk about the shape of a bomb to call it barrel or cylindrical or whatever, the state of the art drones, American drones in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Yemen, with the state of the art, precision missile has killed more civilians and innocents than killing terrorists. So it's not about this bomb that doesn't aim, that kills discriminately. Then it's about the way you use it. But you are acknowledging then that you do use it. You do use barrel bombs. You're just no, saying There's that. no such a thing called barrel bombs. You have bombs. And any bombs is about killing. It's not yeah. about tingling people. It's Most people killing. understand what a barrel bomb is. I mean, they understand how, how it's put together, what's put inside of the barrel, and they understand how it's dropped from helicopters. <laughs> no, we have, we have a very good uh, military industry for years, for decades in yeah. Syria. We don't have to make bombs, very primitive one, very malicious one. This bomb, this term was used only to demonize the Syrian army. That's it. This part of the propaganda. If barrel bombs were used by the Syrian army, would you order the Syrian army to stop using barrel bombs? Again, bomb? what this term? What the barrel bomb is? I mean, do you it's, describe the missile that it, you have it, by being It's Hendrick? a bomb that inflicts terrible civilian casualties. Any bomb is made, and missile, and even bullet, is made to make casualty, but not civilian. There's no uh, uh, military uh, means was uh, made in order not to kill. But how you use it? It's again about the way you use it. It's not about the bomb. If you, I mean, if so, you want to talk about casualties, that's another issue. Every uh, war, every war is malignant. 
Every war is bad. You don't have benign war. And that's why wars are bad, because you always have casualties. But that's not related to a certain kind of bombs or bullets or whatever. This is another, completely another issue. Are, are you denying that their barrel bombs are being used and inflicting great casualties? Again, I was always say, what is use, a barrel bomb? we use a bomb, yeah. we use missile, we use airplanes, we use uh, bullets. You don't describe what we use by the shape, whether it's called barrel, barrel, spherical, cylindrical, and so on. You don't describe it this way. You use armaments. If you, if you have casualties, it's a mistake that could happen in every war, but your aim is always to kill terrorists, not to kill your people, mm. because you have support by your people, you cannot but, kill but them. But you are acknowledging that they come from helicopters, Sorry. barrel bombs. This is technical issue, military issue, how to yeah. throw it. No, you can but, throw them. But only one? No, no. Only you can, one? You can throw bombs by any airplanes. You can throw them by uh, missiles. You don't have to use helicopters. You can use them the way you want. But I, if I hear you correctly, yeah. is that you acknowledge that their barrel bombs are being used, but they're like other bombs in your judgment, uh, and they're not necessarily any different than no, other weapons. That's we, what you we, seem to be we do, saying. We don't have a bomb that's called barrel bomb. This name came through the media, or from the media. Well, we, we can don't, describe we what don't it have is. It. What you call it, what you call our bombs, that's related to, to, to the media. And that's used by the militants, then adopted by the West in order mm. to demonize the Syrian army. We don't have something called barrel bombs that killed indiscriminately. If you have a strong bomb or a weak bomb or good bomb or whatever, I mean, you can call it whatever you want. We have regular bombs, traditional armaments. That's what we have. You have often spoken about the danger of a wider war in the Middle East. Yeah. Let me talk about the parties involved. Uh, and characterize how you see them. Let me begin with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is an uh, anarchic autocracy, medieval system that's based on the Wahhabi dark ideology. Actually, let's say it's a marriage between the Wahhabi and the political system for 200 years now. That's how we look at it. And what is their connection to ISIS? The same ideology, the same background. So ISIS and Saudi Arabia are one and the same? The same ideology, yes. Same ideology. ideology. It's Wahhabi ideology. They base, uh, their ideology is based on the books of the Wahhabi in Saudi Arabia. So you believe that all Wahhabis have the same ideology as yeah. ISIS? Exactly, definitely. And that's known by ISIS, by Al-Qaeda, by Al-Nusra. It's not something we discover or we, we, we try to promote. It's very, uh, I mean, their books, they use the same books to indoct indoctrinate the people. The How Wahhabi about Turkey? Books. Uh, Turkey, let's say, is about Erdogan, his uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, fanatics. And doesn't mean that he's a member, but he's a fanatic. President Erdogan is? He's a Muslim Brotherhood fanatic. And uh, he's uh, somebody who's suffering from political megalomania, and you think that he's becoming the Sultan of the new era, of the 21st century. <laughs> you think he could stop the border if he wanted to? Yeah, of course, definitely. He, he doesn't only ignore the terrorists from coming to Syria, he, he supports them logistically and militarily, directly, on a daily basis. And if you take the example of Kobani, what he called it Kobani, it's called El Arab, the city where the Kurds were fighting uh, ISIS and where the campaign started, the military campaign, the American military campaign started there. It took them four months to liberate that small city uh, not only because the airstrikes were cosmetics, as we, as we said, but because of the direct support of the Turks to ISIS. They were supporting them directly? Directly, directly. You, you were quoted the, as saying that the Syrian army could have eliminated ISIS in Kobani in, in three weeks. Actually, uh, similar cities with the same terror and the same size were liberated in a few weeks, yeah, without, without even using the airstrikes. Why have you spent more time attacking Aleppo than Raqqa? But we didn't attack Aleppo. We tried to get rid of the terrorists everywhere. But, uh, were the terrorists in Aleppo or were they moderates? In Aleppo? Yes. No, you don't have any moderate militants in Syria. No well, moderate no militants moderate, in Syria? No moderate. Again, go back Everybody, to... Everybody... So the definition of a terrorist is what? Of terrorism? Judgment? Whenever you hold a gun and kill people and destroy uh, public buildings, destroy uh, private uh, properties, that's terrorism. The same. So anyone who opposed your government in Syria and used 
military tactics was a terrorist with the military tactics using or without we using weapons to the, the word opposition everywhere in the world including your country is a political opposition do you have military opposition in the united states would you accept it but you wouldn't and we wouldn't no one accept military opposition Oppos uh, military one, means it's, it, it's one thing to say there is military opposition it's another thing to call them terrorist so, military opposition is terrorism whenever you hold a gun and machine gun and try to destroy and kill and the threat this is terrorism by every uh, definition in the world it's not my definition whenever you want to make opposition it's going to be political opposition like your country use the same criteria we don't have different criteria than the one that you have in the United States or in Europe or anywhere else if there's a negotiation uh, would you accept as part of the negotiation and share power in Syria with anyone who is in opposition to you now, whether they are moderates, whether they are terrorists, but if in fact they lay down their arms and say, we want to be part of a future government, a transition yeah. government in mm -hmm. Syria. Whenever they lay down their arms, they're not terrorists anymore. Whenever. Any ISIS? ISIS will not. This is, I mean, this is, uh, how to say, virtual. For ISIS to lay down their arms, this is virtual because their ideology is they want to fight and to be killed and to go to heaven, to go to paradise. That's how we look at it. They won't negotiate anyway. So we don't have to answer something which is virtual, not realistic. The realistic one, that many of the militants lay down their arms and they are working with the government now. This is reality. I'm not talking about what's going to happen in the future. That's happening and that's part of the reconciliations. Some people are interested in politics. They can take that uh, track. And some people are interested only in going back to their normal life and work any, any job, mm -hmm. not being part of the politics. Of course, we are open. Whenever there's political op opposition, we are fully open to deal with them. As you know, Secretary Kerry has called you a brutal dictator. Secretary Kerry. Other people have said worse. Um, does that bother you? Is that an accurate description of you? Uh, you wanted the rest of the world to know the reality. Of course, you won't be happy to hear something which is far cry from the reality. But at the end, this kind of description to an official uh, wouldn't be really important unless the Syrian citizens said this word. And because the Syrian people still support you, it's, not imp it's impossible to be a dictator, killing brutal, killing your people, and have the support of the people. With respect. There's contradiction. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to have that conversation because mm -hmm. with respect, it, it, it is said that you know, there was a time several years ago uh, in, in which you were in a very difficult place. And some people thought the government might fall, yeah. even suggestions that you were planning to leave. Mm -hmm. And then the Iranians came in, and Hezbollah came in, and the tide began to turn. Is that a fair appraisal no, of the circumstances? Because if it's true, it means that the Syrian people hmm. were not supporting you. Yeah. Because before foreign forces came in, you were about to lose. First of all, the Iranian never came during the conflict. Well, well never. Well, never well, said. Invite, uh, General, no, 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 no. General Soleimani was here in Damascus. He's always here. For, for, for decades, <laughs> <laughs> this kind of cooperation, no, like no, you no. say, now we have, we have, uh, we have, he was here for the same reason he is in Iraq right now. Yeah, yeah, but, but there's He's advising, difference. There's difference he was between advising him. Hezbollah and you have cooperation as America with different countries. You send experts, you have kind of cooperation that's different from sending troops. Is that correct? Different. Sending troops is different from having cooperation on, 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 well, if you're on, able on to higher come, levels. If you're, it doesn't matter whether you, where they came from, if they are under your command, so to speak. I mean, yeah. if you're giving direction to Hezbollah. Yeah. But the, the central point I want to no, put... You, no, what you mentioned, what I mean, your question implied that the Iranians are fighting in Syria. That's completely not incorrect. Not, not no, any, no, not correct, no. definitely. We, we, if if they, they come here, we will announce. We don't have problem. We have the right to bring our allies to fight with us. At the same time, we announce that Hezbollah is in Syria. We didn't deny this. So why to, deny, they, the, the, why to deny Iran not to deny, to deny Hezbollah? We don't. Yeah, but my argument with you, and, and you are an artful debater, my argument is, and I'm asking questions, not, yeah. I have no position here. My question is, you know, if the Syrian people supported you 
why when the so-called Arab Spring came, were you almost about to lose power until outside forces came in? It's I, self-evident that the Syrian no. people were not supporting you if you were facing that kind of... If you have real as Arab Spring today, neither Iran nor Russia, uh, not even Hezbollah can help you. The difference in situation that you mentioned earlier between the beginning of the crisis and today that we, ha we are gaining more support by the Syrian people because they discover the truth. At the very beginning, many people weren't, I mean, the vision weren't clear for many Syrians. Now it's very clear. And we have support even from many people in the opposition against the terrorism. So the main factor why the situation has changed, not Iran or Hezbollah, is the Syrian incubator, the Syrian population. That's what is different. Hezbollah is uh, not uh, a big army. It cannot uh, play that role all over Syria. Well, the game on the ground didn't change until they came here. No, that's not true. No, no, that's not true. So you didn't need them? No, we needed them, of course. That's alliance. We need them. That they, they play an important part. But it, they, the, what has changed the balance that you mentioned, when you talk about 23 million in Syria, the when population. you have Arab Spring, uh, let's say a few thousand fighters from, from Hezbollah wouldn't change the balance. What has changed the balance is the incubator that moved toward the government. That's what has happened. Here's what's also clear, that even though Secretary Kerry has suggested he want, you are part of the problem or part of the solution, and they want you to be part of the solution, but they have not yet changed their mind that you have to agree to share power or give up power. They don't want you in power. First of all, they didn't try to make the negotiations or dialogue with us, so they don't know what we want. And that's why I'm here. <laughs> See, that's why I'm here to tell, have you tell me what you want. That's exactly ah, okay. why I'm here. Tell me what you want. What we want is whatever the Syrian people want, as I said, as a president, to but stay or not. If the Syrian people are supporting you, you have a relationship with them, and you know what they want. Yeah. Now, so what do you want? Now we want in such circumstances, we, are, we always ask for two things. First of all, dialogue. Second, sharing, sharing of power by any political entity that represents Syrian people. Not political entity that is being forged in the United States, CIA, or in France, or in Qatar. By patriotic Syrian opposition that represents the Syrians. And we have it, we have in Syria. Many. So what do you mean by sharing power? I mean, if you want to, talk, to go back to constitutional procedures, they should go to elections, they can share in the parliament, uh, in the local administration, uh, in the government, uh, in everything, and the, to be part of the decision in, in the government, like any country. You and your father have held power in Syria for how many years? The combination of you and your father, how many years? Is it a calculation uh, of years? Yes. Or public support? No years. There's a big difference. How long do you have? Years doesn't matter how many of the questions. Well, it does matter. I mean, do the, no, what's matter for us, do the Syrians support these two presidents? Doesn't matter if they are father and son. We don't say w, George W. Bush is the son of George Bush. It's different. He's president, I'm president. He has support from that generation. I have support from these generations now. That's the question. How do you know doesn't that? matter how many. It's how not. It's not the family rule, as you want to imply. It's not. No. No, it's not. No, it's not family rule. It has nothing to do with me being president. When he died, I was nothing. I was just in the army. I wasn't uh, official. I, I wasn't, let's say, a high-ranking official. The, you know the, con the, the. You know your family much better than I do. But the conventional wisdom is that after your older brother died, your father wanted you to come back. Um, because he wanted you to be able to actually, assume power when he left. Actually, the reality is the opposite. He wanted me to stay as a doctor and to go back to London, and I refused. That's the reality. He didn't want you to come no, back? No, never. He didn't want me to be part of the politics. Then why did you become part of the political process when to, you were a doctor? I want, I, we live in a political family, we live in a political environment, and I'm, I'm in the army anyway, I'm a doctor in the army, and the army during the history in Syria has made the history and the reality in this country. That's because he was such a significant political figure in the Middle East, mm -hmm. um, would he have done things differently if he was That's the president of Syria question. today? 
I cannot answer on his behalf. That's a virtual question. Nobody knows. Do you think he would agree with what you've done? Uh, definitely, he wouldn't uh, allow the terrorists to take over. Uh, he wouldn't submit to uh, external intervention. And ISIS is external. And he would have defended his country like he did during the Muslim Brotherhood. The same happened on a smaller scale in the 80s, late 70s, early 80s, when the Muslim Brotherhood started assassinating and killing and destroying and burning. And he fought, he fought them. That's his mission as a president. That's what you have to do to leave terrorists killing your people. That's uh, your mission. Is it a I fair appraisal so. of what you believe that everything must be done and the end justifies the means yeah. to stop terrorism in Syria as you define it? No, it's not ends justified. I mean, this is Machiavellian principle. You should have values and principles. You have constitutions and you have interests. So according to your values, you have to defend your people, the population, the Syrian citizen. You have to defend your country. For your interests, you have to get rid of the terrorists. So that's how we think, not only Machiavellian way. Tell us what the Russians want. They Sorry. are a strong ally of you. Yeah. What do they want? Uh, definitely, they want to have balance in the world. It's not only about Syria. I'm a small country. It's not about having a huge interest in Syria. They could have it anywhere else. So it's about the future of the world. Uh, they want to be great power that uh, have uh, their own say in the future of this world. That's and what, what they do they want for Syria? The stability. They stability. want stability and political solution. And what does Iran want? The same. The same. Syria and Iran and Russia see eye to eye regarding this conflict. And what is your obligation to both of them? Uh, what do you mean obligation? What is your... What do you owe them? Yeah, I know, but they didn't ask for anything. Nothing at all. That's why what I said. They don't do that for Syria. They do it for the region and for the world, because stability is very important for them. Because if you have conflicts here, it will burn somebody else there. If you want to talk about terrorism, terrorism has no boundaries. They see, he see it sees no uh, borders, no political borders. It's much more difficult to take any procedure to face it than uh, do it uh, do toward uh, the internet, which is difficult to control. When you have ideology, it crosses everywhere. It could reach Russia, it could reach Turkey, anywhere. So they have the same interest. Russia and Iran and many other countries who support Syria, not because they support the president, not because they support the government, because they want to help themselves and have stability in the, in the region. Let me present an alternative argument, yeah. um, which the United States may very well believe, that they support you because they've had a long-standing relationship they support you because they want access to Lebanon. They support you because it's part of the larger conflict between Sunni and Shia. You mean the Iranians or the Iranians, Russians? Iranians, talking about the Iranians. No, I think the Iranians... And because they've supported you militarily and with uh, financial... The, the way the Iranian looks at the Shia-Sunni Shia, issue or conflicts uh, is that this is the most detrimental thing that could happen to Iran because it's going the most detrimental to, to Iran. To Iran. Yeah. This conflict is the most a, detrimental thing. Anything related to Shia, Sunni Shia conflict is detrimental to Iran. That's their point of view and that's how we uh, see it. We agree with that. So actually they are going the other way. They want always to have reconciliation, unification between the Muslim because that's very good uh, for Iran. Uh, they don't want to be part, they don't look at the issue of Syria as part. They know that Saudi Arabia and the Wahhabi, they wanted to instigate this conflict in order to bring more of the Muslims yeah, well, on their sides. As you know, there are many people who look at the Middle East today beyond Israel and say within the Islamic world, it's all about conflict between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Those two are mortal enemies fighting for influence in the Middle East. That's not precise for one reason, because it's, it looks like if Iran wants to attack the Sunni and Syria wants to attack the Shia. It's actually started with Saudi Arabia after the revolution in Iran in 79. 
So it didn't start from Iran. Iran never interfered, uh, interfered in any other nation's internal issues, including Syria. We have good relations with them. They never tried to, uh, to interfere. Now, actually, it's Saudi propaganda. I mean, the whole issue of Sunni and Shia conflicts is Saudi initiative and propaganda. It's a reality, but because of the Saudi, not because of the... But in Syria, they are on opposite sides. They Saudi tried to... Saudi yeah. Arabia and that what are ISIS, on opposite sides. That's what Saudi Arabia wants to promote, and that's what ISIS wants to promote, and that's what Al-Nusra wants to promote. Okay. In their political uh, discourse, they always mention the sectarian issues. Yeah. I'm now talking about uh, how you see here, the region, and what's happening now. Mm -hmm. One is the rise of ISIS here in Syria, the rise of ISIS and affiliated groups in Iraq. When you look at Iraq, the Iranians uh, are supporting Shia militia in Iraq, mm -hmm. and they've been a very effective fighting force. The United States is engaged in airstrikes. They just had an airstrike yesterday mm -hmm. in Tikrit, which the Iranian militias had helped capture, correct? Yeah, no, it, not everything is correct. What's not it's, correct? It's, not, it's not only Shia militia who are fighting. Uh, uh, no, the Iraqi many army. Other, yeah. Many others joined. Right. So it's mixture now. What's the possibilities of Iranian-American cooperation? Uh, regarding fighting ISIS? Yes. Uh, I don't think anyone trusts that or believe that the American administration wants to really fight this kind of terrorism. Because, I mean, if you look at the airstrikes in Syria and Iraq, the whole 60 country uh, uh, launch much less airstrike than only the Syrian army do on a daily basis, much less, so they're not serious. Second, they only attack the northern uh, part of Iraq. I mean, they attack the terrorists in, in the northern part of Iraq, not the rest of Iraq. Why did they join now? They want to get part of the cake if there's a victory against the terrorists, just to say that we fought terrorists and we defeated ISIS. Where were they during the last few months? They so suddenly wanted to to attack and... Uh, so what do you think Iran wants in Iraq? They want to get rid of the terrorists, definitely, and to have stability. How long do you think that'll take? No, no, nobody has any idea because, you know, you have support from the outside, you have the support of the petrodollars of ISIS and many extremists in Iraq and in Syria. So how long that, will, uh, that uh, support will continue, uh, we cannot tell. When, when, when you look at the future, um, and you look at the battle ahead, yeah. how much of the conflict that's here today yeah. can the Syrian government withstand? How much the Syrian country, the civilian loss, uh, will there be anything left in Syria? Yeah, of course, <laughs> Syria is still here. It's not the first kind of crisis that you've been facing during the history. But nothing like the that. History. Now, during the history, you had many uh, crises similar. Uh, Damascus and Aleppo has de been destroyed uh, many times, but I mean, it's about the population. The Syrian population are determined to survive and to protect their country and to rebuild it. How much? It's about the potent power that every population have. And the Syrian people prove that they have strong potential, potential in that regard. Anyway, we don't have any other option. We, what option do we have? Whether we suffer, whether we pay high price or, or less price. Or, well, what, what options do we have but to defend our country, but to fight terrorism? We don't have any other option. I asked the question because um, many asked, what's the cost to Syria of what it's going through? Mm -hmm. And how will you put the pieces back together? Whenever there is finally an end to this, yeah. how will you put the pieces back together and who will put the pieces yeah. back together? Uh, there's misconception in the West that what's happening in Syria is a civil war. This is where you can ask that question. What's happening in Syria is not civil war. When you have civil war, you should have, uh, uh, I would say, clear lines separated between different sects or ethnicities or different components. That's not what we have. What we have are terrorists infiltrated areas and people are suffering from the fight with those terrorists and, or, and from the terrorism of those uh, terrorists. So you don't have division in the society now. You don't have the sectarian issue now. Actually, you'll be surprised if I said, if I tell you that the sectarian situation in Syria today is better than the sectarian situation, let's say, 
before the crisis. People are more unified now regarding the conflict, regarding the unity of the sect, the religions, and, and so on. So we cannot talk about how can you uh, uh, rebuild, the, let's say, the society. The society suffering from humanitarian aspect uh, of the problem, but it's not divided anymore. That's very important. And that's why we are assured that, I mean, even this conflict, which is very bad conflict, as you say, uh, every cloud must have silver lining. And this is the silver lining in this conflict, that the population are more unified now. So we don't have problem as long as the society is unified and homogeneous. Regardless of some dark part of this society, ideological uh, corners in our society that support the Wahhabi, support ISIS, and su support the extremists, but it's not uh, the, the, the general situation in our, in our society. Why do you think that the people in the West question your legitimacy? This intervention in Syria matters. I don't care about it, to be frank. I never care about it, as long as I have the public support of the Syrian people. That's my legitimacy. Legitimacy comes from the inside. But why? I will tell you why. Because the West used to have puppets, not independent leaders or officials in any other, other country. And that's the problem with Putin. They demonize Putin because he can't say no and he wants to be independent because the West, especially the United States, don't accept partners. They only accept followers. Even Europe is not partner of the United States. That's to be very frank with you. So this is their problem with Syria. They need somebody to keep saying yes, yes man, a puppet, a marionette, and so on. Somebody who can control from, by remote control. There are those who argue that you feel now uh, that you are militarily stronger, uh, that the advent of the Hezbollah and Iranian advisors and, and American airstrikes and coalition airstrikes, uh, that you feel militarily stronger and therefore you're less willing to negotiate. Any war can deplete the strongest power, even the United States. When you go to war, it, you will be depleted in every sense of the world. And we are a small country. We'll be depleted more than a great country. So you cannot say that you are militarily power. This is again the reality. But you can say that you are politically power because when you win the heart and mind, of the people, the more support from the population, this is where you became more powerful. So what we achieved militarily, not because we are stronger militarily, because we have more support. And how much do you believe you may have some opportunity to win the hearts of the minds and hearts of the Syrian people because they fear ISIS more than anybody? We cannot ignore this reason or this, let's and say, this ISIS factor. has changed the circumstances. Yeah. We cannot ignore that factor. We cannot ignore it. We don't say no. This is factor. But you have another factors. When you're transparent with the, uh, with, the, with the citizen, with the people, when you're patriotic, you work for their interest, uh, they will support you even if they disagree with you politically. So we don't have support now from the traditional supporters. We don't have uh, support because they don't oppose us. We have opposition who oppose our, our government in many aspects, economy, politics, uh, political systems, and so on. But they know that we are working for this country, and when you have a war, it's time for unity, not time, time, not time for division or recriminations, and so on. That's why I said we can have more support, and we have, we've had it, we've already had it recently. What, what circumstances would cause you to give up power? When I don't have the public support, when I don't represent the Syrian interests and values. And how do you determine that? I have direct contact with the, with the people. How could any... So you, you determine whether they support you? No, 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 I don't determine. I sense, I feel, I'm in contact with them. I'm a human. How, how can a human make direct relation with the population? I mean, the war was very uh, important uh, uh, lab for this support. I mean, they could have, if they don't support you, they could have and go and support the other side. They didn't. Why? I mean, that's very clear. That's very concrete. Some have argued to me hmm. that the majority of Syrians support neither the government nor ISIS. Some they don't support either. Either. 
No, don't support the government or ISIS. If you don't, if you don't, if you don't, I mean, this is like saying that ISIS is like the government. I don't think this is realistic. Even people who oppose the government, they oppose ISIS. That's how we say. Look at it. That's the question, isn't it? Yeah. Even those who oppose the government oppose ISIS. Yeah. And the question is, how do you bring those two together? Huh. And what are you prepared to do? And what are they prepared to do? And how will you get those people who have a vested interest here, like the Russians and the Iranians and the Americans, very, to very, agree? Because very simply, they cannot put the government and ISIS on the same level. So the, the, it's not difficult for them to choose. They didn't choose, I mean, not to support the government doesn't mean to support ISIS. It means automatically they're going to be with the government against ISIS, but not with the government in other issues. It's opposition. I mean, you have point of view. But as I said, it's not time for division. You now you support the government. When you get rid of ISIS, then you oppose the government in your own way. You use political means. But which raises but, the question. But you cannot compare government with the terrorist. Which raises the question, can you, can you destroy ISIS without coming together exactly. with a united plan, uh, with a common purpose, on the local level, and, sorry. Go ahead. On the local level, you are correct. You cannot destroy terrorists, not only ISIS. You have a Nusra Front, which is as dangerous as ISIS. You cannot destroy them unless you are unified as a society. But again, ISIS now is not the Syrian case. ISIS in Syria and Iraq and Libya. So you know, it's not enough to be unified on the local level. It's on the regional level and in the international level something we don't have yet. That's why defeating terrorism is going to be very difficult because something of that situation. Something we don't have yet. So that's, that's the question. Yeah. You don't have it yet. And how do you get it? Because that's the future. You are talking about more than one party. You are talking about the international parties, first of all, the United States, regional party, first of all, Turkey, which is our neighbor and playing a very negative role, Saudi and Qatar, and the local party. We, want, we would like to see this cohesion in fighting terrorism, but how can we convince them? We tried, maybe not directly because we don't have any direct channels with them, but that's how it should be. If they could see the reality and the future in a clearer vision, they wouldn't have this division. They would make dialogue with, uh, with every country, including Syria, not because they support the Syrian president or the Syrian army. We don't need their support internally. It's about only fighting terrorism. You need to make dialogue. You cannot fight it. You cannot kill them and defeat them from the air. That's well known. It's for foregone conclusion. That's true in Iraq or here. Anyway, you, you can't defeat them from no, the no, air. No, 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 you cannot. You Do cannot. you want to see another conference like the Geneva conference that failed? Yes, and that's uh, the aim of Moscow conference. Next one. That's it. That's it. Yeah. And what might happen there? Uh, that depends on different parties. I mean, I cannot talk on behalf of every party. For us as Syria, you should have principles to, be, to, to support, I mean, to, to, to agree about, let's say, some principles like unification of Syria, uh, denouncing terrorism, something like this. And then... Sharing you, power? Sharing power, that's in the Constitution anyway. I mean, sharing power is based on how much grassroots you have, how much of the Syrian you present. You don't come and share power just because you want to share power. You should have public support. You have support. to be forced to. Sorry? You have to be forced to share power. Exactly, exactly. You, ha you have to have to represent them. So uh, 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 maybe if we reach a uh, conclusion and uh, we uh, reach agreement in, in Moscow, it could be as preparation to, to, to go to Geneva 3, for example. But it's still early to, 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 to tell. I came here after Secretary Kerry had made his remarks. My impression once I got here is that when you heard those remarks, you were optimistic. The State Department backed back a little bit and said, we still think there needs to be a new government. But that they, you were optimistic after you heard that. You believe there is a way for your government and the American government to cooperate yeah. and coordinate. That's not the main point after, uh, I mean, uh, regarding that statement. I think, I think the main point, we could have a feeling, and we hope that we are right, that the American administration started to uh, abandon this uh, policy of isolation, which is very uh, harmful to them and to us, because if you isolate country, you isolate yourself as the United States 
from being influential and effective in the course of events, unless you are talking about the negative influence, like making embargo that could kill the people slowly, or launching war and supporting terrorists that could kill them in a faster way. So our impression, let's say, we are optimistic, more optimistic, I wouldn't exaggerate, that at least when they're thinking about dialogue, doesn't matter what kind of dialogue and what the content of the dialogue, and even doesn't matter of what their real intentions, but the word dialogue is something we haven't heard from the United States on the global level for a long time. But you just did from the Secretary of State. We need to negotiate. Exactly. That's, that's what, dialogue. That's what I said. I mean, that's why I said it's positive. That's what I said. We are more optimistic. I mean, when they abandon this policy of isolation, things should be better. I mean, when you start the dialogue, uh, things will, will, will be better. Why don't you reach out to Secretary Kerry and say, let's talk? Are they ready? To let's talk. talk. We, we are always open. But, we, we never closed our doors. Mm -hmm. They should be ready for the talk. They should be ready for the negotiations. We didn't uh, make the embargo on the United States. We didn't attack uh, the American uh, population. We didn't support terrorists who did anything in the United States. Actually, the United States did. We, were always, we always wanted to have good relations with the United States. We never thought in the other direction. It's a great power. Nobody, no, not a wise person, think of having bad relations with the United but, but States. But can you have good relationship with a country that thinks you shouldn't be in power? No, this is not going to be part of the dialogue, as I mentioned earlier. This is not their business. We have, we, we have Syrian citizens who can decide this, no one else. Whether they want to talk about it or not, this is not something we're going to discuss with anyone. Mr. President, thank you. Thank you for you.